Chapter 9. Is medieval Iceland an example of anarcho-capitalism working in practice? Ironically, medieval Iceland is a good example of why so-called anarcho-capitalism will not work, degenerating into de facto rule by the rich. It should be pointed out that first, uh, first that Iceland nearly a thousand years ago was not a capitalistic system. In fact, like most cultures claimed by so-called anarcho-capitalists as examples of their utopia, it was communal, not individualistic. Society was based on artisan production with extensive communal institutions as well as individual ownership, i.e. use, and a form of social self-administration. The thing, both local and Iceland-wide, which could be considered a primitive form of the anarchist communal assembly. As William Ian Miller points out, people of a communitarian nature have reason to be attracted to medieval Iceland, the limited role of lordship, the active participation of large numbers of free people in decision-making within and without the homestead. The economy barely knew the existence of markets. Social relations preceded economic relations. The nexus of household, kin, thing, even enmity, enmity and more, the, uh, more than the nexus of cash bound people to each other. The lack of extensive economic differentiations supported a weakly differentiated class system, and material deprivations were more evenly distributed than they would um, be once state institutions also had to be maintained. Blood taking and peacemaking, feud law and society in Saga, Iceland, page 306. At this time, Iceland, quote, remained entirely rural. There were no towns, not even villages, and early Iceland participated only marginally in the active trade of Viking Age Scandinavia. There was, uh, there was a diminished level of stratification which emerged from the first phase of social and economic development, lent an appearance of egalitarianism. Social stratification was restrained and political hierarchy limited. Jesse Bjork, uh, Viking Age Iceland, page two. That such a society could be classed as capitalist or even considered a model for an advanced industrial society is, well, staggering. Kropotkin in Mutual Aid indicates that Norse society from which the settlers in Iceland came had various mutual aid institutions, including mutual, uh, communal land ownership based around what he called the village community. And the thing, see also Kropotkin's The State, its historic role for discussion of the village community, it it's reasonable to think that the first settlers in Iceland would have bought, uh, would have brought such institutions with them, and that Iceland did indeed have its equivalent of the commune or village community, the hreppar, which developed early in the country's history. Like the early local assemblies, it was not so much discussed in the sagas, but is mentioned in the law book, a word I can't even begin to pronounce. It was composed of a minimum of 20 farms and had a five-member commission. The Repar was self-governing, among other things, and responsible for seeing that orphans and the poor within the area were fed and housed. Repar also served as a property insurance agency and assisted in case of fire and losses due to diseased livestock. In addition, as in most cap pre-capitalist societies, there were commons. Common land available for use by all. During the summer, common lands and pastures in the highland, often, uh, often called almening, were used by the region's farmers for grazing. This increased the dependence of the population from uh, it, this increased the independence of the population from the wealthy, as these public lands offered opportunities for enterprising individuals to increase their store provisions and to find saleable merchandise. The merchandise. <coughs> Thus, Icelandic society had a network of solidarity based upon communal life. This, quote, the status of farmers as free agents was reinforced by the presence of communal units called hrepar. These were geographically defined associations of landowners. The hrepar were self-governing and guided by a five-member steering committee. As early as the 900s, the whole country seemed to have divided into hrepar. The hrepar provided a blanket of local security, allowing the land-owning farmers a measure of independence to partic participate in the choices of political life. Through cooperation among their members, Hrepar organized and controlled summer grazing lands, organized communal labor, provided an immediate local forum for settling disputes. Crucially, they provided fire and livestock insurance for local farmers. They also saw to the feeding and housing of local orphans and administered poor relief to people who were recognized as inhabitants of their area. People who could not provide for themselves were assigned to member farms, which took turns in providing for them. 
in practice, this meant that each commune was a mutual insurance company, or at least a miniature welfare state of sorts. And membership in the commune was not voluntary. Each farmer had to belong to the commune in which his farm was located and to contribute to its needs. Um, ordered Anarchy State and Rent Seeking, the Icelandic Commonwealth, 930 to 1262 by Solvason and uh, Gurararson. Oof, roof, brutal. The Icelandic Commonwealth did not allow farmers not to join its communes. And once attached to the local repar, a, fil a farm's affiliation could not be changed. However, they did play a key role in keeping the society free as the repar was essentially non-political and addressed subsistence and economic security needs. Its presence freed farmers from depending on an overclass to provide comparable services or corresponding security measures. Therefore, the Icelandic Commonwealth can hardly be claimed in any significant way as an example of so-called anarcho-capitalism in practice. This can also be seen from the early economy, where prices were subject to popular judgment at the skuldaping, uh, payment thing, not supply and demand. Um, Kirsten Hastrup, uh, Culture and History in Medieval Iceland, page 125. Indeed, with its communal price-setting system in local assemblies, the early Icelandic Commonwealth was more similar to a guild socialism, which was based upon guildings, uh, guilds negotiating just prices for goods and services rather than capitalism. Therefore, Miller correctly argues that it would be wrong to impose capitalist ideas and assumptions onto an Icelandic society. Inevitably, the attempt was made to add early Iceland to the number of regions that socialized people in nuclear families within simple households. What the sources tell us about the shape of Icelandic householding must compel a different conclusion. In other words, Kropotkin's analysis of communal society is far closer to the reality of medieval Iceland than so-called anarcho-capitalist attempt to turn it into some kind of capitalist utopia. However, the communal nature of Icelandic society also coexisted, as in most, other, uh, as in most uh, such cultures, with hierarchical institutions, including some with capitalistic elements, namely private property and private states, around the local Goldar. Uh, Goldar. The Goldar were local chiefs who also took the role of religious leaders, as even the Encyclopedia Britannica can explain to you. It was, the Goldar was a kind of local government which, uh, which evolved in Iceland, by which the people of a district who had the most dealings together formed groups under the leadership of the most important or influential man in the district, the Godi. The Godi acted as a judge and mediator and took a lead in communal activities, such as building places of worship. These local assemblies are heard of before the establishment of the Althing, the national thing. <coughs> this Althing led to cooperation between the local assemblies. Thus, Icelandic society had different elements, one based on local chiefs and communal organizations. Society was marked by inequalities, as among the land there were differences in wealth and prominence. Distinct cleavages existed between landovers and landless people and between free men and slaves. This meant that it was marked by aspects of statelessness and egalitarianism, as well as elements of social hierarchy. Although Iceland was not a democratic system, proto-democratic tendencies did exist. The Icelandic social system was designed to reduce the power of the wealthy by enhancing communal institutions, though. Quote, The society was based on a system of decentralized self-government. The Viking Age settlers began by establishing local things, or assemblies, which had been the major forum for, meet, uh, for meetings of freemen and aristocrats in the old Scandinavian and Germanic social orders. They, the Icelanders, excluded overlords with coercive power and expended the mandate, uh, extended the mandate of the assembly to, f uh, to fill the full spectrum of the interests of the landed free farmers. The changes transformed a Scandinavian decision-making body that mediated between freemen and overlords into an Icelandic self-contained governmental system without overlords. At the core of Icelandic government was the Althing, a national assembly of freemen. Therefore, we see communal self-management in a basic form, plus cooperation between communities as well. These, communal, uh, these communistic uh, mutual aid features exist in many non-capitalistic cultures and are often essential for ensuring people's continued freedom within those cultures. Usually, the existence of private property, and so inequality, soon led to the destruction of communal forms of self-management, with participation by all male members of the community as in Iceland, which are then replaced by the rule of the rich. 
While such developments are a commonplace in most primitive cultures, the Icelandic case has an unusual feature which explains the interest it provokes in so-called anarcho-capitalist circles. This feature was that individuals could seek protection from any godi. The extent of the godord, the chieftaincy, was not fixed by territorial boundaries. Those who were dissatisfied with their chief could attach to another godi. As a result, rivalry uh, arose between the godar, the chiefs, as may be seen from the Icelandic sagas. This was because while there, were, uh, there, were a se- there was a central legislature and uniform countrywide judicial and legal systems, people would seek the protection of any godi, providing payment in return. These goldi, in effect, would be subject to market forces, as, dis- as dissatisfied individuals could then affiliate themselves with another goldi. This system, however, has an obvious and, well, fatal flaw. The position of the goldi could be bought and sold, as well as inherited. Consequently, with the passing of time, the goldard, for large areas of the country, became concentrated in the hands of one man, or a few men. This was the principal weakness of the old form of their government. It led to a struggle of power and was the chief reason for the ending of the Commonwealth and for the country's submission to the King of Norway. It was the existence of these hierarchical elements in Icelandic society that explain its fall from anarchistic to statist society. As Kropotkin argued, from chieftainship sprang on the one hand the state and on the other hand private property. Act for yourselves, page 85. Kropotkin's insight that chieftainship is the transitional system has been confirmed by anthropologists studying primitive societies. They've come to the conclusion that societies made up of chieftainships or chiefdoms are not states. Chiefdoms are neither stateless nor state societies in the fullest sense of either term. They are on the borderline between the two. Having emerged out of the stateless system, they give the impression of being on their way to centralized states and exhibit characteristics of both. Since the Commonwealth was made up of chieftains, this explains the contradictory nature of the society. It was in the process of transition from anarchy to statism, from communal economy to one based on private property. The political transition within Icelandic society went hand in hand with an economic transition, both tendencies being mutually reinforcing. Initially, when Iceland was settled, large-scale farming based on extended households with kinsmen was the dominant economic uh, mode. This semi-communal mode of production changed as the lands was divided up, mostly through inheritance claims between the 10th and 11th centuries. This new economic system based upon individual possession and artisan production was then slowly displaced by tenant farming in which the farmer worked for the landlord, starting in the late 11th century. This economic system, based on tenant farming, i.e. capitalistic production, ensured that great variants of property and power emerged. Kirsten Hastrup, Culture and History of Medieval Iceland, pages 172 to 173. So, significant changes in society started to occur in the 11th century. As slavery all but ceased, tenant farming took its place. Iceland was moving from an economy based on possession to one based on private property. And so the renting of land was widely established practice by the late 11th century. The status of the Godar must have been connected with land ownership and rents. This led to increasing oligarchy. And so the mid to late 12th century was then characterized by the appearance of a new elite, the big chieftains, who are called the Storgodar, who uh, struggled from the 1220s to the 1260s to win what had earlier been unattainable for Icelandic leaders, the prize of overlordship or centralized executive authority. During this evolution in ownership patterns and the concentration of wealth and power into a few hands, should note that the Godis and uh, wealthy landowners' attitude to profit-making also changed. With market values starting to replace those associated with honor, kin, and so on, social relations became replaced by economic relations and the nexus of household. Kin and thing was replaced by the nexus of cash and profit. 
The rise of capitalistic social relationships in production and values within society also reflected in exchange with the local marketplace, with its pricing subject to popular judgment being subsumed under central markets. With a form of wage labor, tenant farming, being dominant within society, it's not surprising that great differences in wealth started to appear. Also, as protection did not come free, it's not surprising that Agodi tended to be, uh, become rich. Also, in Kropokin's word, the individual accumulation of wealth and power. Powerful Godi would be useful for wealthy landowners when disputes over land and rent appeared. A wealthy landowners would be useful for a Godi looking for income. Concentrations of wealth, in other words, produce, con uh, produce concentrations of social uh, concentrations of wealth produce concentrations of social and political power and vice versa. Power always follows wealth. Kropokin, Mutual Aid 131. The transformation of possession into property and the resulting rise of hired labor was a key element in the accumulation of wealth and power and the corresponding decline in liberty amongst those farmers. Moreover, with hired labor springs dependency. The worker is now dependent on good relations with their landlord in order to have access to the land they need. With such reductions in the independence of part of Icelandic society, the, un <laughs> the undermining of self-management and the various things was also likely as laborers could not vote freely as they could be subject to sanctions from their landlord for voting the wrong way. Quote, the courts were less likely to base judgments on the evidence than to adjust decisions to satisfy the honor and resources of power uh, powerful individuals. Thus, hierarchy within the economy then spreads to the rest of society, and in particular, social institutions reinforcing the effects of the accumulation of wealth and power. <coughs> the resulting classification of Icelandic society played a key role in its move from relative equality and anarchy to a class society and statism. As Miller points out, <clears throat> as long as the social organization of the economy did not allow for people to maintain retinues, the basic egalitarian assumptions of the honor system were reflected reasonably well in reality. The mentality of hierarchy never fully extricated itself from the egal egalitarian ethos of a frontier society created and recreated by jur uh, jur juridicially equal far uh, farmers. Much of the egalitarian ethic maintained itself even though it accorded less and less with economic realities. By the end of the Commonwealth period, certain assumptions about class privilege and expectations of deference were already well established to have become part of the lexicon of self-congratulation and self-justification. This process in turn accelerated the destruction of communal life and the emergence of statism focused around the Godord. In effect, the Godi and the wealthy farmers became rulers of the country. Political changes simply reflected economic changes from a communalistic, anarchistic society to a statist, proprietarian one. Ironically, this process was a natural aspect of the system of competing chiefs recommended by so-called anarcho-capitalists. In the 12th and 13th century, Icelandic society experienced changes in the balance of power. As part of the evolution to a more stratified social order, the number of chief uh, chieftains diminished and the power of the remaining leaders grew. By the 13th century, six large families had come to monopolize the control and power, uh, ownership of many of the original chieftaincies. These families were called Storg uh, Storgodard, and they uh, gained control over whole regions. This process was not imposed as the rise in social complexity was evolutionary rather than revolutionary. They simply moved up the ladder. This political change reflected economic processes. For at the same time, other social transformations were at work in conjunction with the development of the Stolgadar elite, the most successful among the uh, Bendir, the farmers, also moved up a rung on the social ladder, being big farmers or st uh, Storbadir, uh, Bendir. Um, unsurprisingly, it was the rich farmers who initiated the final step towards statism. And by the 1250s, the Storbendir Bendir and their followers had grown weary of the Storgodar and their quarrels. In the end, it was they who accepted the king of Norway's offer to become part of his kingdom. The obvious conclusion is that as long as Iceland, uh, Iceland was not capitalistic, it was anarchic, and as it became more capitalistic, it became more statist. 
This process within, wherein the concentration of wealth leads to the destruction of communal life. And so the anarchistic aspects of a given society can be seen elsewhere. For example, in the history of the United States after the revolution or in the degeneration of the free cities of medieval Europe. <clears throat> Peter Kropotkin, in his classic work, Mutual Aid, documents this process in some detail in many cultures and in time periods. However, that this process occurred in a society which is used by so-called anarcho-capitalists as an example of their system in action, reinforces the anarchistic analysis of the status nature of anarcho so-called anarcho-capitalism and the deep flaws in its theories, as was discussed in section 6 of this chapter. As Miller argues... It is not the have-nots, after all, who invented the state. The first steps towards state formation in Iceland were made by churchmen and by the big men content with imitating Norwegian royal state. Early state formations, I would guess, tend to involve the redistributions not from rich to poor, but from poor to rich, from weak to strong. The so-called anarcho-capitalist argument that Iceland was an example of their ideology working in practice is derived from the work of David Friedman. Friedman is less gung-ho than many of his followers, arguing in The Machinery of Freedom that Iceland only had some features of a so-called anarcho-capitalist society and that provides some evidence in support of his ideology. How a pre-capitalist society can provide any evidence to support an ideology aimed at an advanced industrial and urban economy, well, that's hard to say, as the institutions that society cannot be artificially separated from its social base. But ironically, though, it does present some evidence against so-called anarcho-capitalism precisely because of the rise of capitalist element within it. Friedman is aware of how the Icelandic Republic degenerated and its causes. He states in a footnote in his 1979 essay, Private Creation and Enforcement of Law, a Historical Case, that, quote, The question of why the system eventually broke down is both interesting and difficult. I believe that two of the proximate causes were increased concentration of wealth, and hence power, and the introduction into Iceland of a foreign ideology, kingship. The former meant that in many, in many areas, all or most of the Kador were held by one family, and the latter that by the end of the Sturlung period, the chieftains were no longer fighting over their traditional quarrels of who owned what to whom, but over who should eventually rule Iceland. The ultimate reasons for these changes are beyond the scope of this paper. However, from an anarchist point of view, the foreign ideology of king, uh, kingship would be the product of changing socioeconomic conditions that were expressed in the increasing concentration of wealth and not its cause. After all, the settlers of Iceland were well aware of the ideology of kingship for the 300 years during which the republic existed. As Bjork notes, Iceland inherited the tradition and the vocabulary of statehood from its European origins. On the mainland, kings were enlarging their authority at the expense of the traditional rights of free farmers. The immigrants to Iceland were well aware of this process. Available ev evidence does suggest that early Icelanders knew quite well what they did not want. In particular, they were collectively opposed to the centralizing aspect of a state. Unless some kind of collective and cultural amnesia occurred, the notion of a foreign ideology causing the degeneration is, well, hard to accept. Moreover, only the concentration of wealth allowed would be kings the opportunity to develop an act and the creation of boss worker social relationships on the land made the poor subject to and familiar with the concept of authority. Such familiarity would spread into all aspects of life, combined with the existence of prosperous and so powerful Godi to enforce the appropriate servile responses, ensured the end of a relative equality that fostered Iceland's, uh, Iceland's anarchistic tendencies in the first place. In addition, as private property is a monopoly of rulership over a given area, the conflict between chieftains for power was at its most basic, a conflict of who would own Iceland and so rule it. <coughs> the attempt to ignore the facts that private property creates rulership, i.e. a monopoly of government over a given area, and that monarchies are privately owned states, does Friedman's case no good. In other words, a system of private property that has a built-in tendency to produce both the ide ideology and fact of kingship the power structures implied by kingship are reflected in the social relations which are produced by private property. 
Friedman is also aware that an objection to his system is that the rich or powerful could commit crimes with impunity since nobody would be able to enforce judgment against them. Where power is sufficiently concentrated, this might be true. This is one of the problems which led to the eventual breakdown of the Icelandic legal system in the 13th century. But so long as power was reasonably dispersed, as it seems to have been for the first two centuries after the system was established, it's a less of a serious problem. Which is quite ironic. Firstly, because the first two centuries of Icelandic society was marked by non-capitalist economic relations, communal pricing, family and individual possession of land. Only when capitalistic social relations developed, hired labor, property replacing possession, market values replacing social values. In the 12th century, did power begin to become concentrated, leading then to the breakdown of the system in the 13th century. Secondly, because Friedman's claiming that so-called anarcho-capitalism will work if there's an approximate equality within society. But this state of affairs is one a most so-called anarcho-capitalists claim is impossible and undesirable. They claim there will always be rich and poor, but inequality in wealth will also become inequality of power. When actually existing capitalism has become more free market, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Apparently, according to so-called anarcho-capitalists, in an even purer capitalism, this process will somehow magically be reversed. It's ironic that an ideology that denounces egalitarianism as a revolt against nature implicitly requires an egalitarian society in order to work. In reality, wealth concentration is a fact of life in any system based upon hierarchy and private property. Friedman is aware why so-called anarcho-capitalism will become ruled by the rich, but prefers to believe that pure capitalism will produce an egalitarian society. In the case of the Commonwealth of Iceland, well, this didn't happen. The rise of private property was accompanied by a rise in inequality, and this led to the breakdown of the republic into statism. In short... Medieval Iceland nicely illustrates David Wick's comments as uh, quoted in chapter 6, section 3, that when private wealth is uncontrolled, then a police judicial complex enjoying a clientele of wealthy corporations whose motto is self-interest is hardly an innocuous social force controllable by the po uh, possibility of forming or affiliating with competing companies. That is to say that free market justice soon results in rule for the rich. And being able to affiliate with competing defense companies will be insufficient to stop or change that process. This is simply because any defense judicial system does not exist in a social vacuum. The concentration of wealth, a natural process under the free market, particularly one marked by private property and wage labor, has an impact on the surrounding society. Private property, i.e. monopolization of the means of production, allows monopolists to begin, become a ruling elite by exploiting and so accumulating vastly more wealth than, well, the workers. This elite then uses its wealth to control the coercive mechanisms of society, military, police, private security forces, call it what you will, which it employs to protect its monopoly and thus its ability to accumulate ever more wealth and power. Thus, private property far from in 